A great place to start in point of care ultrasound is the EFAST exam, or the Extended Focused Assessment of Sonography and Trauma. This is one of the exams that started it all. We started using this in the emergency department to rule out pericardial tamponade, and have now extended its use to rule out large intraperitoneal and intrathoracic fluid. In the emergency department, we love ultrasound exams that can rapidly narrow the differential diagnosis for a critically ill patient, and the EFAST exam does just that. It can rapidly rule out large amounts of intraperitoneal blood, as well as blood around the heart, within the chest, and large pneumothoraces. Trauma societies throughout the country have adopted this exam as part of their trauma workup and is now taught as part of the Advanced Trauma Life Support course and should be included in your primary assessment of the patient within the C or circulation section. Now the value of the FAST exam is most apparent in the patient that's hemodynamically unstable. Identifying fluid that is typically more than 250 cc's within the abdomen is anywhere from 75 to 99 percent sensitive using the FAST exam. Identifying pericardial fluid due to a penetrating wound to the heart and pericardium is nearly 100% sensitive. However, penetrating wounds to the abdomen may not lead to large amounts of intraperitoneal blood and may instead injure the bowel, making the FAST exam not the ideal test. In addition, it is not the most sensitive test to identify pelvic injuries. But at least in one study, a negative FAST meant that none of those patients required a surgical intervention. The E portion or extended portion of the exam includes evaluation of the chest, attempting to rule out a hemothorax and pneumothorax. Ultrasound is excellent in ruling out fluid within ch in the chest, as well as a much superior test to rule out pneumothorax than chest x-ray, and some studies has been even as good as uh, CT. In one study uh, comparing chest x-rays to ultrasound, the ultrasound sensitivity was almost uh, 80%, whereas the chest uh, uh, radiograph plain film was about 40%. Now onto the nuts and bolts of the actual exam. There are three cardinal views of the abdomen, including the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, and the suprapubic views. Additionally, there'll be a cardiac view as well as two lung views. It is not particularly important the order in which you do the exam, however, most people start in the right quadrant because this is the most sensitive place in the supine patient to see dependent fluid in the intraperitoneal space. Then you'll progress to the other views, always keeping the indicator of your ultrasound probe to the patient's right or the patient's head. Standing on the patient's right side, place the ultrasound probe on the patient's right flank. The indicator should point towards the patient's head. You should get a view of the liver and the kidney and the space between, which is also referred to as Morrison's pouch. The ultrasound probe should be posterior in the patient's body so you can identify the dependent fluid. Typically, your hand will be resting on the bed, and you are searching for an anechoic strip of blood within the space between the liver and kidney, or Morrison's pouch, and above the diaphragm in the thorax, indicating a hemothorax. In this normal right upper quadrant, the bright line on the left of the image is the diaphragm. The bright line on the bottom is the spine. There's the liver and the anterior portion or top portion of the image and a kidney below it. Moving the probe, just one rib interspace inferior in the patient's body identifies the tip of the liver as well as the inferior portion of the kidney, which is a location that fluid often hides in the abdomen. In this normal image, we've labeled the liver, kidney, spine, and lung, as well as an arrow on the left identifying the diaphragm and an arrow on the top which identifies Morrison's pouch or the hepatorenal recess. Now here's a patient who has an abnormal right upper quadrant who's in a motor vehicle collision. There's an anechoic or black strip of fluid between the liver and the kidney and Morrison's pouch, which indicates intraperitoneal blood. Here's another example of a similar patient that had more subtle findings, where uh, she had just fluid or blood around the tip of the liver. If we travel one rib interspace up towards the head of the patient, we can identify fluid within the chest. Typically, you don't see the spine extending all the way into the thorax unless there is blood or pleural fluid within the chest cavity. Here's another great example of what we call the spine sign that we can visualize because there's fluid within the chest cavity. And finally here, we have an example of a subtle fluid within the chest cavity in the right upper quadrant.
The left upper quadrant of the patient is imaged similarly to the right upper quadrant, where the spleen is used as an acoustic window just like the liver. However, your hand position is typically a little bit more posterior in the patient, and one rib interspace towards the patient's head, indicator is still pointed toward the patient's head. In the left upper quadrant, you want to identify the spleen, kidney, as well as the diaphragm and lung. And you're looking for anechoic fluid within the chest cavity that's above the diaphragm, as well as fluid that will collect around the spleen. Fluid does not typically collect between the spleen and the kidney as that is adherent, which is a large contrast to the right upper quadrant. Therefore, imaging the entire spleen as well as the bottom of the lung is essential in this examination. In this blunt trauma patient, we could easily see the spleen, kidney, as well as the bottom portion of the diaphragm, and we identified some free fluid around the superior portion of the spleen. As we move more posterior in the patient with ultrasound probe to the dependent portions, we can see a larger pocket of fluid surrounding the superior part of the spleen. This ultrasound image was misread as having free intraperitoneal fluid within the left upper quadrant. However, on further inspection, this is a common mimicker of fluid, the stomach. Can you appreciate the rugae and the contained nature of this fluid? The left lower thorax is imaged the same as the right lower thorax, in which you typically should have a mirror image of the spleen or liver, but instead if you see anechoic fluid or positive spine sign, you should be concerned for a hemothorax. Imaging the pelvis is different only in that you get two views of the pelvis to make sure you don't miss any fluid. In the sagittal view, the ultrasound probe is placed just above the symphysis pubis and the indicator points towards the patient's head. You should see an image of the bladder in males and bladder and uterus in females. And you're looking for fluid that collects uh, posterior to the bladder in the uh, vesicular uterine space or posterior to the uterus in the retrouterine space or pouch of Douglas. In the transverse view, the ultrasound probe is in the same location except that the indicator is pointing towards the patient's right side. In this normal sagittal view of a male patient, we are demonstrating how to fan left and right to rule out any free fluid. We will then switch our view to a transverse and scan cephalad and caudad in the patient, carefully interrogating the posterior part of the bladder for free fluid. Apply the same technique in the female pelvis. Start in the sagittal view, identify the bladder and the uterus, interrogate for fluid in the vesicular uterine space as well as the retro uterine space or the pouch of Douglas. Then transition to the transverse view and do the same. On this image, the bladder is on the top of the screen. Just below it or more posterior is anechoic fluid, which is free intra-abdominal fluid. On this image, we have bladder on the right side, which has urine within it, and just anterior on the left side is free intra-abdominal fluid. This image is more subtle. We have bladder on top, which is anechoic, and uterus right next to it. And just below the uterus, you see a little bit of free fluid. Here we started transverse, and we think we see some free fluid right next to the bladder. So we go sagittal, and now we can see fluid on either side of the uterus. And we finish it up by looking at the right upper quadrant, which has free fluid as well. The typical cardiac view is a subxiphoid view. You point the indicator towards the patient's right and push the probe in right underneath the xiphoid process. Using the liver as an acoustic window, you point the ultrasound beam very anterior in the chest where the heart is. You should see some liver anterior as well as a four chamber view of the heart. Try to identify all four chambers as well as the very bright pericardium around the heart. Look at this normal ultrasound video and go back and forth and identify the anatomy. In this sub view, you can see a very small strip of anechoic fluid around the anterior portion of the heart, signifying a small pericardial effusion. Compared to this patient who is stabbed in the chest and has a large hemopericardium that is creating cardiac tamponade. If you're unable to get an adequate sub view because the patient's obese or pregnant or has too much bowel gas, rapidly switch to a transthoracic view. Take the ultrasound probe and place it just left of the sternum in the fourth or fifth intercostal space. The indicator will point towards the patient's left hip or the right shoulder depending on the machine you're using. This will give you a parasternal long access view of the heart. In this view, you can evaluate the left atrium, left ventricle, as well as the aortic outflow tract. However, we are really concerned in this exam about pericardial fluid. In this transthoracic view, we can identify our cardiac anatomy as well as a small pericardial effusion as well as the descending aorta. Here's one more example of pericardial fluid wrapping around the heart in a transthoracic view in a pediatric patient. And here's also a pericardial effusion that includes some fat pad 
around the heart. A fat pad can mimic a pericardial effusion, however, they typically are not fully displaced during ventricular diastole, and they will have some echoes, as in they will not be completely anechoic. Just as fluid is dependent in the abdomen, air is dependent in the chest and will rise to the most superior portion of the chest. When evaluating for pneumothorax, you take the ultrasound probe and you'll put it on the most superior portion of the chest. You can use a phased array, curvilinear, or linear probe, but what you're looking for is two ribs which will shadow and the pleura between these ribs. The pleura is going to slide back and forth as the patient breathes, and you'll see this as uh, lung sliding, sparkling, ants on a log. It's described many different ways. You'll also see some comet tail or ring down artifacts. If, you, if these are absent, then you're concerned about a pneumothorax. If the patient does have a pneumothorax, the image is going to look very similar. You'll still see ribs with shadowing, you'll still see a pleural line, except you won't see sliding and you won't see common tail artifacts. Because these images look similar, even though this patient has a pneumothorax, it can be challenging. I suggest you go to the contralateral lung and look for normal sliding, and then it'll be obvious. So compare this normal sliding one more time to these images where there is obviously no sliding. Now before moving on and watching a full complete exam, let's talk about some common pitfalls. In regards to pneumothorax, right mainstem intubation as well as bullous disease and scarring can mimic pneumothoraces. However, in the unstable patient, you may just have to assume that it's attention pneumothorax. For the right upper quadrant, many things can mimic free fluid, such as the gallbladder, a renal cyst, and the IVC. If you have the gallbladder in view, you know that you're pointing the ultrasound beam way too anteriorly and need to point it posterior towards the dependent portions that the fluid can collect. Renal cysts are common mimickers of free fluid, both in the left upper and right upper quadrants. However, if you interrogate it fully in two planes, you'll see that this fluid is contained within the parenchyma of the kidney. In the left upper quadrant, the stomach can also mimic free fluid, which we discussed earlier. This can be very subtle or very obvious depending on the contents of the stomach. A common pitfall when imaging the pelvis is to allow the posterior portion of the pelvis to be overgained. That means too bright. When the ultrasound waves go through the bladder unimpeded, they create this posterior acoustic enhancement and you have to manually decrease the gain in order not to miss free fluid. And last for now, a pleural effusion can mimic a pericardial effusion at times. It's important to really locate where the fluid is, and at times the descending aorta can really help you, whereas fluid that is uh, anterior or above the descending aorta is pericardial fluid, fluid below it or more posterior in the transthoracic view is pleural fluid. Now check out this real fast exam.